Hey guys, welcome back to another segment of Beyond the Music with Laura for Center Stage Magazine. I'm really excited about our next guest today. A lot of times we do a lot of things with artists and people you should know. Although she's not a artist, so to speak, as a musician, she's definitely somebody you should know. And a lot of times it's those behind the artist that tend to kind of fall in the background and not be known, but she's definitely one that you need to know. Welcome, Deb Klein. How are you? Oh, thank you. I'm 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 great. I'm just actually uh, sitting here working on this Friday afternoon and uh, sending uh, emails to Dana Colley and Mark Schumann from um, this documentary that we're going to talk about today. Well, so. then you can tell them that Center Stage and Laura said hello. That would be <laughs> great. Absolutely. Um, I actually wanted, I'll tell you, it, it, a lot of people said, okay, why do you want to interview Deb? What, what part of this? Uh, you can talk to the producer. You can talk to some of the musicians. And let me tell you why, and this is what I said to them. I personally was an artist manager myself, um, and I did that for four years, going into it, not having a clue. So when I watched that documentary, which my editor gave to me and said, I, you take this, I'm, I'm swamped. And I thought, I don't know why I'm doing this. I have no idea. Never heard of morphine. What in the world? So, honestly, I fell in love. I fell in love. And I sat and cried, and it just touched me. And I felt a real connection with you as Mark's manager and friend because I know what that what that connection is. And that's why I wanted to talk to you. Um, so it, tell me, tell me how you guys met. Um, well, yeah, that's kind of an interesting story. Um, you know, I didn't start out my music career as a manager. Um, I started out as uh, I was a dancer. I was a DJ. I went to Emerson College and studied communications, and just always knew I was going to do something with music. Um, and uh, you know, when I was on the air, I was uh, spending a lot of time going to see bands play and booking bands, and um, we had a whole underground music scene in Boston, and that's actually where I met Mark Sandman for the first time. Uh, his One of his many projects was always uh, looking to play, play live, and, you know, playing live for him was the ultimate uh, musical uh, vehicle or discovery for him with all the different projects that he had, and he would test things out, and he would get people's reactions, and I was one of those people. <laughs> and uh, he, we met, I was in law school and um, his bands would play these underground places and he'd see me studying my law books and he always came over and talked to me about, you know, what I was doing. And then he saw my progression in the music uh, industry where I ran a like, record label and, you know, he always sought out my advice, which I thought was so interesting. And I didn't realize at the time that that's really a big part of what managers do. Right. besides hustle and work and bang down doors and make lots of phone calls and actually make things happen, they offer their advice. And he was really, you know, looking to me, um, uh, you know, at the time to say, you know, what do you think this album cover or what do you think this song or this, you know, track listing or what do you think should I do this record deal? And I ended up becoming his lawyer after I graduated from <laughs> law school. And he really was interested in young people and taking a chance with younger people. And, you know, because he had been around the block before and had big time management with his prior band, um, Free to Write. And I think he was looking for something different his second time around. I think he really wanted to enjoy his musical career and the business of it and be more in control of it, um, you know, with experience. You know, a, you know that the, the, there comes wisdom and knowing right. what you like to do and what you don't want to do. And I think he felt, you know, he could mentor me and, you know, pretty much you know, make me a manager whether I wanted to or not. Um, he could really form you to be the manager that time. he could form you to be the manager that he needed you to be for him. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, that was the trick of it, right? Cause exactly. He he wanted to do things a certain way, and I was young enough to say, okay, sure, if that's the way you want to do it, then. That's the way you want to do it. I didn't know that four buses drove at night, and <laughs> you know, they didn't stay in the same city day after day wasting money because you know, that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to 
and for, you know, have residencies and, you know, be a part of the local scene and kind of really soak up, you know, the the atmosphere of every city that they went to. And, you know, he loved cities and he loved spending. And he didn't want to go to the podunk. He was like, you know, I'll play Chicago three nights and people can drive and see us. <laughs> that was right. His, kind of his. Right. And again, well, like, I really didn't, I didn't know about secondary markets and, you know, I so it was interesting how I how I learned and you know for good or bad or, or for you know great actually because it was really breaking the mold and doing things the way he wanted to and that's kind of how the music was as well. Well, you know, and I think broke. a lot of those true artists that's that's where they that's where it comes from is that genius of I've always said they don't I don't think any artist true artist thinks the way any normal for lack of a better word person does it's so out of the box and different for them, um, which it seemed to be for him with uh, with some of the things I saw in the documentary of trying different things and different instruments and uh, I mean a three piece band. Come on, <laughs> well, three piece. I, I have I actually manage a three piece right now and I'm so excited about them and there's something magical about the three piece. I have to say, uh, my band Walk Rat. It's a uh, Timmy from Rage Against the Machine and it's his punk band and their music is nothing like Morphe, but it does have that same kind of magical feeling of when you get three musicians kind of locking into a sound that's unique and and it just resonates for some reason. So yeah, he he um he he definitely you know he he had four pieces and he had he had a eleven piece band, you know the. And the hypnosonics with the big horn sections, but the one that really stuck, the one that really hit people was morphine. And that was when, you know, he, when he realized that, that's when, you know, he asked me to be his manager. And I said, okay, <laughs> I'll do it. Well, I love the music. I'll, I have to do it. <laughs> I'll have to email you and, and or call you at some other point and we'll talk about Walk Red. I'll go check them out. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they're great. <laughs> um, did you, I, I noticed that, um, and I really kind of lost my train of thought there. I had it, and then I got on the subject of walk rest. Um, I, I assume you all were very good friends as well. Um, it's hard to be that close with somebody on a on doing what they want to do and not be really good friends. It seems he was in interviews or things like that, uh, seeing the term of would only talk about the music or would not open up to personal things. But on his downtime, would he would he do that with people that he trusted? Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, Mark was, well, let's say he, he yeah, he was, I mean, I, I, Mark and I were friends before I became his manager. I mean, that's kind of an unusual situation. Most people, when they start a business relationship with somebody and, and you know, it's business and then you, as time goes by and, you know, you talk more on a regular basis, then you may or may not become friends depending on if you had common interests. But with, you know, with Mark, you know, yeah, he was a true friend. I mean, he loved music and he, loved art and travel and good food and, you know, he would speak about, you know, his, you know, his family life or, you know, just his thoughts on politics and books and, you know, his art and, you know, everything. So he was like a, you know, like he wanted to uh, not just talk about music. And I think all of those things kind of ended up informing his music and his songwriting. So he was like, you know, open to all these other outside things. And he did, he did talk about stuff. Yeah. Right, right. Well, and I, I noticed that there was a lot of talk about the literature that he would read and, and how that affected some of his songwriting. And on a, a stereotypical level, people just don't think that artists will do that if they're writing about other things, that it just, how did that come from literature? Or, um, so, I, it, I, honestly, I was thinking, because as I said, I knew nothing about it. I was really thinking, I cannot wait to interview this guy. I cannot wait. To, I really, somehow, I have to interview him until I got a little further in the documentary. And I re, I just cried. I just cried. And it, you actually got me because when you said that you had to be the one to tell Vine and, and everyone, I, I couldn't. I was thinking, I put myself in your shoes thinking, oh, my gosh, how did she do that? Because not only is she care about him and has lost an important person in her life she has to now share that news too so it the the documentary came out very very well for a person who had never heard of of mark any of the guys in the band um any of the music who has now made me a fan but has also made me an 
educated about who they are and want to know more. I went back and watched uh, the 2011 Mark Sandman story um, and have just searched for more information and more information. And and I, I tend to share it with other people, too. Have you heard of that band, Morphine? <laughs> so oh, it that's is so a, funny. <laughs> it's a great thing, and I noticed it's gotten tons of uh, awards and, and mentions and stuff. Did you expect something like that when this documentary was, was being produced? I mean, honestly, I mean, it's been so long. You know, I think Mark started a journey of dreams before the other documentary, which was a family member um, that made it more about Mark and not, and not necessarily the band. But mm-hmm. um, And so I didn't really know what to expect. You know, I hadn't really seen a cut of it. Well, I did see an edit of it because I was helping him with some of the music clearances. But, you know, I didn't really see it. See it. I mean, you know, I watched the cut at home and, you know, but when I saw it up on the big screen for the first time, and I was like, wow, like, because, you know, when you're so close to it, it's hard to say, like, well, yeah, if you weren't a fan of the band, would would, would anybody even be interested in this story? Right. And and I right. think I think the answer, well, you just said yourself, I think the answer is yes, because it's it's about the creative process and it's kind of about, you know, a very unique individual who, you know, kind of marched to the beat of his own drum and made his own path and was very individual and a true artist and, and did have a, a lot of impact in an underground, very cool way, you know, at that time in the late 90s and, and you know, well, the early 90s, you know, the whole span of the 90s. And then, you know, but what happened, it's sad that their story didn't get to continue. It didn't get the ending, I felt like, or not even, you know, like, I feel like, you know, they'd still be around today and they would be playing Coachella. You know what I'm saying? Right, like that's right. the kind of band they are. And, and, More and that's a shame. Like Bella, yeah, yeah, and Bonnaroo, and, things like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah and that, of course. And, you know, and, and it's a shame that, you know, that that, that they didn't get their their due. Um, you know, it was, it was too soon. And, and you know, I uh, it's hard. It's, you know, it's hard to think, like, you know, and... But it's it's amazing now to see people like you and other people getting to see this and finding out about the music for the first time. And it's really, you know, it's really stood the test of time. It's not, it doesn't feel old or dated. It's still so fresh and exciting and cool. And you can yeah. put records on now and they just sound great. And Yeah, it didn't um, sound I'm like excited. anything. Yeah, it didn't yeah, sound like anything that people was... to hear it and, yeah, to discover it as well. Yeah, it doesn't sound right. like anything else. Yeah. And, you know, they do say everything happens for a reason in its own time, and maybe that was just, I, I kept thinking of any and all ways to go. I can't imagine that that Mark Sandman would have wanted to go any other way than playing that show in that spot at that moment. I, I You know, if he had to have his choice, it, it just seems to me because of the love that he had for the music and the process and and the audience and everything else that and now with this documentary and and it opening up all of them and him to a whole new audience as you said that would have never that may not have ever heard it before so I'm I'm very honored I got to see it uh you know before it was out there for everybody too but um and and I'm just I am a fan now. I'm I am definitely a fan and and so I, I appreciate that. But I I love the stories and, and the the whole the music itself in general. Um how the, one more question here or two more things. You know, I know they um it seemed like you all tended to try to build that fan base, which it seems the music industry is going back to. And back then there wasn't Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all this to help promote that music the way that it does now, but going out and actually being at these shows. And I love, you said a few minutes ago that he would say, no, they can drive to see me. And I love that because they did. And and it's, yeah, it's they did. <laughs> trying to get artists to believe that now, to go back, okay, you have to build that fan base. Well, how do you do it? Well, hard work and getting the name out there and putting your foot to the ground. Well, but this way is easier so <laughs> it's not do you well, find yeah, it I mean, with yeah i mean people stay home now i mean they you know touring is hard and and you know i feel like the live experience you know for especially a band like them it was just relevant you know like a relevation because people were like you know how can this you know that this, this 
these instruments, and I'll, I'll give, you know, a big credit to Mark Vision and our sound guy, Bill Davidson, and then Dana, you know, what, I mean, all of them, the three of them together, I mean, you know, including the sound guy, I mean, like, Mark wouldn't do shows without him, and it just brought it to this whole new level. So when you see three people on stage and they're making this incredible sound, and people are dancing and they're going, you know, they're really getting into it, it's just like, you know, that's, 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 you know, you can't replicate that sitting home alone in front of a computer. Right. Um, and, 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 you know, that's where I think, you know, like a lot of the, like the newer bands now that go out and they tour and they put on a great show and, you know, you're like, you don't hear their songs on the radio necessarily, but they've got a huge online following. And so, you know, you kind of got to do everything. And as a manager, I'm like, you got to tour, you got to do all the social stuff, you got to do it all. And you have to be great. That's, well, did, you your, know, did your experience with, with them and the way that they did it, does it help influence how you do things now with the artists that you have now? I think it's different for every artist. Um, you know, I can't say that every artist should stay and do a residency and play three nights in a row. Um, you know, that's not their thing. You know what I'm saying? So, right. um, but I did learn the value of grassroots marketing and, you know, building a following from the ground up and word of mouth. And again, you know, it has to be great. It has to be unique. And, you know, I would say that about all of my artists, um, you know, that I've worked with, you know, since then. Um, and currently, and, you know, they all have that special thing, and that's really what I'm looking for, and, you know, they had their special thing, and, you know, yeah, Mark, he he died doing what he loved, and um, certainly learned so much from him, and I'm so grateful for that opportunity. I mean, I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for, you know, him taking a chance on me, so I have a lot to be grateful for, and, you know, I've had a long um, you know, career in the music industry, and I'm, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> I'm here, and I'm still doing it, and I've got great clients, and I'm very fulfilled, and I do have to, you know, thank Mark and Morphine as the first group that I've ever worked with, and the success that came with it, so all that hard work and what we learned to do together was absolutely informed, you know, who I am today as a manager. Well, and one one last question, um, kind of a two-part question, I guess. The, the way the band has continued on with things like orchestra of morphine and things like that, when when I was watching it, my first thought was, oh, I don't think, I, I don't know that from just learning the things in the movie, I don't think Mark would like that. I, it, it's so overproduced and things like the way it came across to me. Then I sat back, watched it again, and watched it again and thought, well, maybe he would. How do you think, how, this is the two parts, how do you feel about it continuing and how do you think he would feel about it? continuing the way that it does well i mean i think it's an interesting question because you know i think things in 2016 it's a lot different than what it was in 1999 when he passed and and so to look at it through a lens of you know so many years and how things have changed you know the answer is going to be different today than it would have been 20 years ago um you know i think 20 years ago you know the idea of replacing a lead singer it just didn't happen, and right. especially when someone passed, and you know, in such a way, and it was so unique, and his voice was so unique, and it was so fresh. And so I think the, the way they continued on by having, you know, like they did Twine Men with Laurie Sargent, who was singing, and they would do some morphing songs, and they would do some other songs, and some, you know, and and in a way, uh, paying homage. Um, without trying to be morphine, you know what I mean? So, like, I think he right. would have been great with an orchestra morphine because those are the guys who were in Hypnosonics and those were his friends and his family, and they were carrying on and making music that he had written but never really got to play live, which was the music for the night. You know, he finished the album, and then he passed. And so, you know, in order to go out and support that album and, you know, have a catharsis for the people left behind, it was really important to do that. And I think he would have been more than okay with everything that we've done since then because, again, no one's tried to step in and fill his shoes. He had very right. big feet, by the way. Very big feet. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, um, uh, and he had good shoes. He always wore good, like, boots and stuff like that. <laughs> but, so, you know, but so no one came along and tried to be Mark Stanley. And I think that was the thing where, you know, now today, you know, we have bands and singers quit and they've replaced them and you know you from sublime with rome to you know three days grace or caesar or something like in the hard rock world you know i mean i've even had experience with a band where we replaced the lead singer and 
you know, and it's more done these days. I feel like it's more accepted or nimble. There's not this like holier than thou protecting of the, you know, the band right. thing. You know what I mean? Like it's just different, you know, and there's so many more bands and and so, you know, today maybe there would have been, but you know, back then no, it wasn't even dreamed of. And I think that the way that Dana um, and Jerome and Billy have kind of continued to play the music and honor it. I think that's super important. And I really like this new group, um, Vapors of Morphine, which I saw in Austin when the documentary first debuted at the first festival, the Austin Film Festival. And um, they screened the documentary and then, the, you know, the band played a, at a club actually on, on another night. And, I, you know, and for me, you know, I'm like the pickiest person in the world. I'm like the original <laughs> fan. <laughs> And so I would be the one that would be the most like, no, that's not going to work for me, you know. Like, right. And, and and it and it did work. And you know, the great thing about it was you close your eyes and it, and it was like, wow. And like, I thought I'd never hear these songs live again. Oh. And then I opened my eyes. Very good when you said that. <laughs> yeah, and it's true. You know, I never thought I'd hear them live again, and I'm hearing them, and it sounds great. And I'm opening my eyes, and it's somebody else singing the songs, and he's not trying to be Mark. And I think that that's the key for them to continue on. He's got to be himself. He is himself. He's not, you know, trying to fill somebody else's shoes, but he's, you know, the music's great and and it sounds great and he does a great job. And so, you know, I would recommend Morphine, you know, to people who've never seen the band, they'll be like, wow, this is incredible. You know what I mean? Like, because they won't have anything right. to compare it to. And I think for people like me who have seen the band, I mean, I'm, you know, no one saw them more than me except the guys in the band and our crew. <laughs> And, you know, and so I think that, 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 you know, that I'll, I, I'm giving it a, a, a thumbs up. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> and it's, and it's not, you know what, and it, and it's, and look, I do miss Mark in that role. And I do miss Mark as a performer because he has something very special and, 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 and it's, but I think there's an honoring of the music and that it's great. And I'm, I'm into it. So I'm psyched to see the show next week because they're going to be playing okay. in LA. Cool. Yeah, cool. Well, and hopefully I can catch them soon somewhere between around Louisville, Kentucky or Nashville, somewhere close around here, then uh, hopefully I'll be able to catch them too. I would love to. And I really have to thank you, Debbie. It, it really means a lot for you to take your time and talk with me. And uh, you definitely are an inspiration for me um, personally, but I, I think you're definitely somebody that, that people need to hear from too. So, Thank you so much for your time. I really do appreciate it. Oh, thank you. It was my pleasure. Okay, you take care, and I will follow up with you on Walk Rat. <laughs> okay, great. Have All a good right. one. Bye. Thanks, Deb. Bye.